few. Let's start with just kind of a quick two, three minutes on your background and um, kind of what gives you the perspective that you have for kind of these types of events. Yeah, so my background is I started in the finance industry back in 1990, straight into a recession, uh, scrabbled around to get a job, couldn't get a job at an investment bank, I had a pretty shitty degree. Um, and so I got into a company called Dow Jones Tellerate, which is an information provider. And my first job was custom support, teaching people, no, helping people that, with a technical analysis product. So I had to learn what technical analysis was, because mm-hmm. I had to train these guys. I didn't know anything about them or about it. So I started learning about technical analysis and realized that, okay, that was quite interesting. I could figure out what was going on in financial markets with a few charts. Uh, then I managed to talk my way into um, a company called James Capel, which was part of HSBC in equity derivatives. And six months later, I was running the desk. Then I went to another UK bank and ended up at Goldman, where I started and managed the hedge fund sales business in equities and equity derivatives, right in line for the Asian crisis, um, which was a incredible moment in time. Then after that, I thought that the recession was coming in 2000, and I thought the better opportunity was to go to trade instead. So I went to the, I started the global macro fund for the biggest hedge fund firm in Europe at the time called GLG Partners. Got that recession, traded all that whole period, uh, and then decided to opt out of the rat race and retire to Spain back in 2005, where I started writing macroeconomic and investment strategy research, because I'd been in the hedge fund and around the hedge fund industry for longer than most people. You know, my entire career was speaking to the most famous hedge fund managers in the world on a daily basis, whether it's Paul Tudor Jones, Stan Druckenmiller, Lewis Bacon, all of these guys. So I get to learn how they do things. I saw almost every trade every one of these guys did over the Asian crisis, which was phenomenal, because then I really understood how they put together a macro view. And just to see them implement trades in different ways and across continents, across asset classes and layer into it, all of that stuff was fascinating. The whole thing was reading like a picture for me. It, it was basically a crash course in what do the richest, most successful people in the world do when everyone else is running. Here's how these guys are navigating these markets and, and how they're profiting in many cases yeah. when this stuff happens. Yeah, because they actually counter to the narrative, the really big money is to be made at cycle turning points. Mm-hmm. And the most money of all is the down cycle. And the reason is, is because the up cycle can take 10 years, like we just had, and the down cycle usually comes in 18 months. Mm -hmm. So the compressed amount of returns that you can get if you can short things or take advantage of that move up in bonds, for example, is truly extraordinary. So um, I asked uh, Mark Yusko, who uh, obviously you know pretty well, uh, one time I said, what separates the top five investors in each asset class from the really, really good ones? So kind of the the absolute best at their uh, craft versus everyone else. And what he said to me is they cut their losers faster than everyone else, and they um, press the winners harder than everyone else. And I don't agree. You don't agree? Okay, why? Because people like... Nick Raditi, who people don't know, he's below the radar screen, was probably the greatest macro trader of all time. He didn't do that. Okay. He had enormous stomach for risk. Mm -hmm. What he had was his, he had, he was a, he had better understanding in his head of the outcomes. Mm -hmm. And therefore, he could ascertain the risk reward so he would suffer more significant drawdowns than anybody else could suffer, but he would make higher returns. So he made more returns than Stan Druckenmiller, more returns than George Soros. Really? At, when he was working for Soros. Wow. Uh, most people don't realize that. But in general speaking, for most people, most people don't have that skill set. Of course. You know. So generally speaking, cut your losers, run your winners, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, that's And that's a very flippant statement because it's actually not that easy to do. Yeah, of course. It's actually difficult not to cut your winners. What, what is um, your current portfolio look like? Just so as we get into this, people kind of understand how you're actually allocating your capital uh, yeah. right now. So my personal capital is allocated to um, bonds. Um, I got I closed some of the position recently. Um, it is um, dollars. It is gold and it's Bitcoin. <laughs> It's a pretty um, defensive <laughs> portfolio. <laughs> and I don't think of it in those terms. I okay. think of what I'm thinking of is bonds. I think you can make an extraordinary amount of money. And I've written about Twitter uh, on Twitter, and I retweeted recently about the greatest trade I ever saw, which happened in 2001 when I was trading, and how similar the setup was t- to today. E- explain that story. That story is a, a story of a guy working for a giant hedge fund in London. 
and the Fed cut, and it's almost identical, the backdrop to today minus the virus, right? Mm -hmm. So we were going to an economic slowdown. It was pretty clear the Fed had to cut. The markets, the bond market starts pricing in Fed cuts. Mm -hmm. So the Fed then do a cut on, I think it was January the 3rd. Mm -hmm. Everyone's still on holiday. But this guy comes into the office at this hedge fund uh, outside London, and he goes, limit long, according to his risk guidelines, euro dollar futures expiring that year. Uh, euro dollar futures are interest rate, three month interest rate futures. So he was betting that interest rates were going to get cut significantly. And he gets on a plane and he goes to his house in Mallorca and stays there. And because he can't take any more risk, mm -hmm. he's got one trade on. And his view is we're going to recession, the stock market's in a bubble, the Fed are going to have to cut significantly and the outs, the downside of the stock market bubble unwinding is the economy goes into recession. That mm -hmm. was his call. So he didn't come back to the office and eventually there was a pickup in rates as people started fading that narrative and thinking growth was coming back, which is exactly what we got in September, October, November, the ships exactly the same. In fact, the, both charts map each other perfectly. The most perfect maps I've ever seen is now versus then. So his boss, one of the most famous hedge fund managers in the world, one of the best risk takers of all time, calls him in and goes, so you've given back a load of money, you've made more money than any other trader at the firm, but you've given back a lot. What do you want to do? And he said, I want to double up. Really? And the guy said, why? He goes, because my case is still valid and I've got profits and it's my risk to run. And the guy said, fine, do it. Because he understood that the guy had the clarity. There's that moment in time mm -hmm. when you have the clarity. And he had the clarity. And he went back to Mallorca. And the reason he was in Mallorca was simple. is He didn't want Stay brokers away. to call him, <laughs> his friends to call him, or anybody to persuade you to get out of the trade. Yep. And he then returned in November, closed the trade, and retired. Do we know what the return was? He made, I believe, for himself, 200 million. 200 million. It's not a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> but again, I don't know quite the numbers and I won't mention his name because he's yep. a private guy, but phenomenal. And that was one trade. One trade, add, close. That was it. When you look at that trade to today, is the same opportunity available? We've just had it. So it's I've been tweeting and talking and shouting and screaming to everybody about this because there's a moment in time when Look, this part of the cycle is what I do. I'm really good at this. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean I'm always right, doesn't mean I don't fuck up, but I'm good at this. And I knew that the cycle was turning. And we, I had a shot in 2016 when we had a, almost a recession. We had the manufacturing recession, but it didn't follow through. But this time it looked like the stars were aligned and the Fed were gonna cut. So I started that whole thing by May um, with the euro dollar futures mm -hmm. and then by August I was pounding the table and screaming and shouting I remember and then <laughs> basically 